Merry Christmas. You know, let's just not even worry. You know, let's just listen to some music. You want to do that? Yeah. Alexa, play a song to set the mood. How about I call your accountability partner? Oh, okay. You know what? All right. Christian, Alexa. Now available at Family Books. Okay, fine. I think we all need one of them, huh? <laughs> uh, so do we need a Christian Alexa to live the resurrection power, or the, to live the Christian life? I am not who I once was, now I live in resurrection power. The answer can be found in more in what God is looking for in John 4, 23 and 24. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So what defines true worshipers and how do they worship in spirit and truth? And that's the path we're going to travel a little bit. Not more than I want, though.
Bible study Wednesday, 7 to 8, Crossroads. Uh, last, next week's the last week. If you want to bring something in, then we'll, uh, we'll finish that up. I think we got 37 made already, so um, just a few more to go. Um, see, I hope I remember the, the punchlines here. What, what kind of car does a chicken drive? A coupe. Right? And what do you call an elephant that doesn't matter? I don't remember. Hold on. I gotta know because I have to tell that one tomorrow too. And I have. Let's see if I look it up here. I don't know. Ah, there it is. I know. Was it worth it? Oh, and. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. <laughs> All right. And last one. What do you call a singing rodent? Justin Bieber. <laughs> okay. Truth. The real facts about something that things that are true. The quality of state of being true. John seventeen seventeen. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is true. You know, the, the thing about Christianity is. There's only one source of truth in the world, and it's right here. Anything that doesn't match up with that is simply a lie. What, Scott was telling me that the Pope said this week that it's premarital sex is not that bad. It's funny, right? It's funny how Christ says one thing, but somebody else will say something else, and people will go, yeah, that's truth. All right, truth, a statement or idea that is true or accepted as true. Not everything believed or accepted is truth. John 141, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak the Spirit. Uh, by the Spirit, you must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many, f what? So anybody who says anything is outside that scripture is what? False prophet. Boy, did he just define himself real easy, this, right? Be really careful what you listen to, because everything isn't truth. If it's not matching up with the word of God, it's not truth. It's lies. And we know who the father of lies is, right? So the title of the message is True Colors. And God sees true colors. God sees in true colors, you know. We see in black and white, some people see colors, but God sees in true colors. And God blesses true colors. So uh, let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you. It is something we can actually look at as just pure truth. And it gives us something to bounce every other point of view off to be able to tell the truth from the lies. And so help us to um, meditate on it, study it, and uh, trust it, God, and no matter what day and age we live in. And so it's in the precious name of your son, Jesus, Lord, we ask pray these things. Amen. And so I, this, this message, is, again, has lots of points in it that I have to go through before I can act, actually get to the main point of the message, and I don't even know if I have enough time to get through it all, so I'm going to get as far through it as I can, all right? Um, There's just a lot of information to, to get across. All right, so point one is God sees everything, and that's really important for us to understand. And there's nothing we do that's hidden in the sight of God. There's nothing done in the world um, that's done without God knowing, all right? You see that a lot of times with Christ, when people come to ask him questions, he would answer the question before they even got it out. He knew why they were there, and he knew where he had to be at certain times for a certain person to be there. Everything was just, he's, he's infinite in everything he does. He sees everything. He knows everything. And that's really difficult for us to understand, but he sees everything. And Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in where? Every place. Watching what? What's he watching over? The evil and the good. Right. He sees everything. Psalm 66, 7. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch over what? The nations. There's nothing going on in the world that God is not alert to or watching, right? Job 31, 24. Does he not see my ways and number all my what? Every step you take. 
Job 33, 11, he puts my feet in stocks. He watches all my paths. Job 34, 21, for his eyes are upon the ways of man and he sees all his steps. It's almost like we're hedged in with God. You know, sometimes you can look back at your life and you go, wow, if I would have went this way, my life would be totally different today. But it's almost like it's not within our ability to choose those things. That God really has set hedges on our path to bring us where he wants us to go. That's why he says a man or a woman plans their way, but God's going to direct their steps. Because Job is saying this simply because this is not the path he would have wanted to walk on, but that's the path God put him on, right? Um, and Psalms 11, 4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. That's mankind. Sees everything. Psalms 33, 13, The Lord looks from heaven and sees all the sons of men. Of men and daughters sees everything. Psalms 33:14. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. Sees everything. Proverbs 5:21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. Jeremiah 16:17. For my eyes are on all their ways; they are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. Jeremiah 32, 19, the Lord is great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of their deeds. Psalms 139, 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Well, that's a lot more than just seeing there, that verse, right? Uh, he is everything. He hears everything. Matthew 12, 36, and I tell you this, you must give account on judgment day for every, what? I don't know where you speak. That's pretty deep, huh? And every word we're accountable for before God. He knows what we think, Matthew 12, 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, that goes on and on and on. He knows what's going to come out of that mouth before it comes out of the mouth, right? The fact is, nothing is hidden from the Lord. And the psalmist said that, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will take hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. There's nowhere. There's nothing you can go, nowhere you can go to hide from. There's everything you say you're accountable for, and he sees and watches every step we take. And then he says, I know how many pieces of hair you have on your head. All right, so point two. Before we can understand true worshipers, we must understand the statement for such people the Father seeks. So the first point we get across here is God sees, hears, and knows everything, right? And then John 4, 23 says, But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And so before we can understand that, we have to understand the part here that says, For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Because it changes the way you think if you don't get the, these points for me to make my point. The statement is not, listen, the statement is not saying this. The Father is seeking true worshipers to find him. That's not what the statement is saying. Okay? Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We all have left God's path to follow our own. All of us. God is not looking down from heaven, looking for people who are true worshipers to follow him. That's not what it's saying. The Father is actively seeking his children to become true worshipers. Right? You'll get that as we go along through this, all right? Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. That's how it's worded. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers, right? Uh, John 6, 37, everyone that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I certainly will not cast out. Everyone who? That the Father gives to Christ, right? The Father seeks us. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless what? The Father who has sent me draws them. You can't come to God on your own, so get over it. I, you know, I, I get a kick out of people who think that way. That's just a prideful stance, 
There's no way. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Unless you know a dead person that can bring themselves back to life, it's impossible. The Father seeks you or sought you and brought you to Christ. All right? The Father seeks and draws us to Christ. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. John 6, 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it be granted to him by the Father. Granted to agree, to do, to give, or allow. We do not have the ability within ourselves. The Father seeks, draws, and grants us to Christ. The flesh profits nothing. We can do nothing in the flesh to draw ourselves to God. Right? Such people the Father seeks to be his worshippers. 1 Peter 1, three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has called us to be what? One again. To the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You must be born again. Remember when Christ came to Nicodemus? And that's another answer he gave before the question came out. Uh, just like and we're just trying to put a representation here, what that, that that statement is really saying is, let me let me ask you a simple question. Did you have anything to do with yourself being born? No, no, do you have anything else to do with yourself being born again? And that's why Nicodemus was blown away, because he spent his whole life practicing the law, thinking the law was going to get him there. He was a top notch in the Pharisee right now. And Jesus blew him away with that statement, saying, No, there's nothing you can do. You have to be drawn by the Father. And then it goes on to say, like, it's like the wind. You can, you can hear it, but you can't see where it's coming or, or know where it's going, right? Um, the Father uh, seeks, draws, grants, and calls us to be born again. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. John 1.13, children born not out of natural descent nor of human decision. Nothing to do with you. Your decision had nothing to do with you being born again. Or of a husband's will, but born of God. Born of God. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Titus 3, 5. He, who saved us? I mean, it's not saving. If I'm out of the water drowning, I can't save myself. He saved us. We were drowning. Not because of the works of our righteousness. God didn't look down and go, oh, that's a really pretty good guy. I think I'll save that person. Right? But according to what? His mercy. By the washing, regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So God, it causes us to be born again by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And regeneration starts before you're born again. It's not like your regeneration, you're born again, the regeneration starts. No, God had to open your eyes and even bring you to the understanding and concept of, of salvation and even have a desire for it. He woke you up to that. You were dead. Such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send from who? The Father. The Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit who proceeds from who? The Father. He will bear witness of me. The Father sends the Spirit to bear witness of this, to the truth. And that's why your eyes were opened to be born again. It is granted to us by the Father to come. The Father draws us to Christ. In mercy, he sends the Holy Spirit to regenerate us. The Father causes us to be born again. Through Christ's sacrifice, he saves us, and the Father gives us to Christ. We are a gift. That's why Christ, if you follow Christ in his teachings, he was, he was looking for those the Father had granted to him. In John 10, 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Right? You were a gift from God the Father to God the Son through the Holy Spirit. You see how it works? Do you have anything to do with it? No, you don't. It's really important you understand that this, it, with this type of thinking, you're going to view the Scriptures in an entirely different way. All right? So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who, ru who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he... What? Hardens who he desires. And you can look up all those verses, okay? And then Romans 9.20 says this, for people who, who comment against this, it says, who are you? 
a mere human being to argue with God. Should the thing that was created say to the one who was created, why have you made me like this? Or does the potter not have the right over the clay to make from the same lump an object for honorable use and another for common use? What if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for what? Destruction. All right, he grants us, he draws us, he sends his spirit to regenerate us, he causes us to be born again, saves us through the sacrifice of Christ and gives us to Christ, Ephesians 1, 5. And that's not it, it doesn't end there. He predestinated us to adoptions as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself. He predestinated us to adoptions as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to a good pleasure of whose will? You don't see anything about you in any of these statements, do you? All right? Adopts us to be his sons and daughters through Christ. An adopted child is chosen by the parent. You don't go out and, hey, uh, you're going to be my parent. The scriptures are clear. God does the seeking and saving, and that's where this verse, for the Son of Man came to what? Seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are in the business of seeking and saving those written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. I mean, this goes from the beginning to the end of the scriptures with this type of thinking. And there's no pride in this, is there? There's no pride in the fact is you have nothing to do with it. Boy, it's just thankfulness, huh? Aren't you thankful he chose you? I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? <laughs> you are going to see many greater things than that. Like Jacob, you are going to see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> from Syria. He came back? Yeah. He said people are already gathering to meet you. Many with afflictions to be healed. Your fame is spreading. The good kind. You should rest. Rabbi, we should leave early. Thank you, boys.
So, you wanted to help build something that would cause prayer and songs, something to bring souls closer to God, yes? Can you start tomorrow? Okay. Remember that, God knew you well before you knew him. And he chose you, and he wants you to get to work, right? <laughs> He just chose you to sit around on the chair, right? He chose you to expand the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit that's indwelling you is to reach out to others, right? The Holy Spirit's in you. And his job is the Father sent him through us to draw people to give gifts to the Son. And that's how it works. And, it, and there's a, there is one verse that looks like it's controversial in Scripture. I was going to go into it, but I don't have the time because it takes a little time to ex explain it. Because you got to look at verses in the context of which Christ is talking. Um, I'll do that another time. Um, he sees his children. I, and remember that he sees your true colors because he knows you before you met him. Right? He knows you. He knows who you are. He knows what makes you tick. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. Actually, let me go back then and read that. I see a true color shining through, and that's what he said here. John, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite whom there is no deceit. He sees the devil's children also. He knows the true colors on both sides. He knows if you're one of his chosen or he's on, you're on the other side. You can give, again, remember, there's only two types of people in this world. There's God's children. There's three, actually. There's the devil's children, and there's the devil's children who are going to become God's children. All right? We just don't know who they are, so we spread the gospel to them all. Right? That's our job. And so here he says that Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is the devil? I see a true colors, John 6, 64, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. True colors, Matthew 13, 27. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the fields where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? He says, an enemy did this, he replied, and the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may also uproot wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at the time I will take the harvest, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles and burn them Bring them, gather the wheat, and bring it into my barn. He's just telling you, even within a church, there's going to be believers, and there's going to be people who think they're believers, and people who just never will be believers. And says, God says, let them all grow together. I know who my children are. He always knows that the true heart. He sees true colors. We can fool people. You know what? Judas walked with them for three years, and when Jesus said, one of you are going to betray me, they didn't all look at Judas, right? He played the game very well for three years. True colors. You are your father the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. It does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whatever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and he's the father of lies. He's talking to the religious people. True colors, John 6, 26, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, because you just want some free food. He you knows if your intentions, what your intentions are in following him. True colors, John 12, 6, he did not say this because, oh, I just read that. Oh, no, no, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. <laughs> As a keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself and what was put into it. True colors, Matthew 15, 8, 9. These people honor me with their lips, but they're what? That's a There's a lot of people who say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a God, I'm a God, but their hearts are nowhere near God. In vain they worship me, teaching doctrines what? Well, that's religion. Drop religion. Religion is man's way of paving way to God. You can't pave your way to God. God finds you. Traditions of men. Well, that sounds like some specific religions. They are true colors. Luke 7, 47. Therefore I tell you her many sins which have been forgiven as her great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. You know, that's just such a profound thought that God knows how much you love him. 
or if you love him at all. True colors. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing, and he what? Believed in his name. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. Why? Because he knew that their belief wasn't true. It was just simply a belief from seeing some miracles. Wow, this guy did something. But they weren't true followers. They weren't his children. They weren't his chosen. So he didn't commit themselves to them. God knows his sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. And they know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have, this is, this is talking about us. Now, he's talking back then, but this is talking about us in the future, right? I have, all, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. He knows the people he is seeking back he knew the people he was seeking back then, and he knows the people he's seeking today. He knows his sheep. So point three, he knows the character he will develop in his people. John 4, 23, but the time is coming, even now has arrived, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit in truth, the character he will develop. Galatians 4, 19, oh, my dear children, I, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is what? Fully developed in you. You know, you don't bring yourself to Christ, and you don't develop yourself in Christ. Now, you, you're, you're, what, what falls into our things is to read God's word and, and, and apply it to our lives, but that Holy Spirit is what's going to develop us into that image of Christ. The character he will develop. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. You can't, we as Christians cannot do anything for God. Only through the power of the Spirit, him working through us, can anything be done for God. The flesh profits nothing in spiritual things. Christ begins the work in us through salvation, Philippians 1, 6. And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Christ continues the work until either we die and go home or Christ returns and we go home. God's Holy Spirit is continually working in the Christian's life. And now that, that can be really a miserable path for you, or it could be an obedient path for you, but one way or another, if you're God's child, he's going to work in your heart and life. So in other words, the, the scriptures are given to us all. When God says, hey, you're my child, this is what I expect of you, and you do your best to live a holy life, because remember, it says, be perfect as I am perfect, right? And so when we decide, I'm not going to do that, God's going to bring discipline in your life and get you back on that right path, right? Or you can be obedient to it and do it yourself. So it's really just a path, but you're his child, it's kind of like your parents and you're not doing what they want you to do there's going to be discipline involved but God's going to bring your fullness and your maturity about in your life and if there is none of that going on in your life really revisit your salvation because I know this, when I'm not on the right path, God's done many things to put me back on the right path All right, been disciplined many times and that's good, because it gets us right back on the right path, right? All right. Point four, the earth is under a curse. Really important you get you thinking, right? I don't know how much time I'm going to have to actually deal with the real point, but here we go. Isaiah 24, 5 and 6, the earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken everything, ever, the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse to what? Devours the earth. You have to understand that. Um, look at the bottom here. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit of the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is what? the ground. And so just as, as mankind became cursed and, we, and death came upon us, when they fell, the curse didn't just fall on mankind, it fell on the entire earth. Right? And, and for time's sake, I don't, I don't really have a lot of time to get this, but we know this. Listen, the earth is right now is being reserved for a day of judgment where God is going to purge it by fire. This earth is going to be destroyed. That's why I'm wasting all this money trying to preserve the earth is such a waste of time. As I, one preacher said, it's like trying to preserve a, a foam cup, spending millions of dollars. The fact is, God is going to destroy this earth. He's going to. 
the earth is cursed. And it's really important you understand that, all right? I mean, you'll understand what I, where I'm going with that in a second. Point five, any investments in this world to find happiness and fulfillment will always let you down. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. You don't see anywhere in Christ's walk where he's investing in this world. He didn't, he didn't, he, what did he say? Well, I, want, I want to go to your house. I don't have a place. I don't have a house. I don't have a place to lay my head. He never made any investments into this world. Why? This world is cursed. Any promises to the Christian um, for fulfillment is always in the, the kingdom coming, not this earth. The earth is cursed. This is not God's kingdom. He didn't come here to set up his kingdom. That's what the Jews thought. He disappointed them, right? Now we're, we're here to build the kingdom of God. All right, so requirements for following Jesus. When we went over these, you have to be loyal. That means a genuine believer, right? You have to have courage, be willing to gamble your life on God. You have to be brave, be willing to fight for what God says is right or wrong. You stand up. You stand up for what you know is right or wrong. You have to press on and endure the hard times. You have to be willing to suffer for them. That comes with part of the plan. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. And the point I want to get to today is requirements for following Jesus, you have to be true. John 4, 23, but a time is coming and even now is arrived when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. True means we worship God in the way he desires, not in the way we think or desire. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. When we're seeing a decline in congregations at more traditional churches across the nation. 95% of churches have under 200 people in attendance in any given weekend. There's a sense that we're losing our consumer base, that we're losing our young people. When the business falters, what do you do? You go back to your customers. What are their needs? What are their desires? Then you give it to them. And so worship must be tailored to the tastes of our target audience. Do you want to build a snowman? Statistics show that the mega church keeps growing. That's very popular for the same reason that people go to football games. There's this mass euphoria and it feels great. There is a spiritual catharsis that takes place. The customer is always right, but the customer and the consumer of worship is not man. It's God. We do not understand how great and holy our God is. Our God, and he's speaking in a New Testament context, is a consuming fire. Yes, the Old Testament God was not to be messed with. It's even more serious in a New Testament context. There is so much more thought that our forefathers put into worship services. All you really need is a Bible, a flask of water, a flask of wine, and a loaf of bread. It's not a cultural phenomenon. It's not a Western thing. It's not a European thing. It is a biblical thing. I thank God for promoting the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why it's so crucial to seek to get worship right. When we put God back in the central place in worship, we don't lose anything, we gain everything. We think, what do I like? Or what would non-Christians like? Or what do the people in my church like? And we're missing the central question. How does God want to be worshipped? John 4, 24, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Worshiping in spirit and truth, a must. And Jesus is going to give us some of the pictures of what this actually looks like. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so the first thing that you see um, Christ pointing out of people who truly worship in spirit and truth is their what? Poor in spirit. And we're going to find it, and I probably am definitely not going to get through all these, but I'll get through a few, that everything the world calls success is almost on the opposite of what Christ calls success. 
and that people who invest their lives into things to find happiness and fulfillment in this life are an opposite of what Christ says will bring you those things. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so, um, and that really is, is a word that is, is talking about humble, but humble in the sense that um, you grieve over, over sin. So in other words, God says that it's better to go to a um, funeral than a wedding. Is that even, like, is that even attached at all to your flesh? Does that even have, no, it, it never will. What God says will bring fulfillment in life is completely opposite to what the world mm-hmm. says. And so what God is saying, it's better to actually be poor in spirit. It's actually better to be approach God humbly and, and mourn over uh, sin then make fun of it, so on and so forth. So in other words, when you look out at the world and um, you see all the evil in the world, and it takes a little while to get to that point of life, like when you see thousands, think about this, thousands of babies are slain a day. The animals that are tortured, and I see doctors who put masks on them, let bugs eat their face, like, yeah, what, what? How do we look at mankind and, 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 and not go, oh, that's terrible? And how do we approach a holy God in our own selves? And let me ask you a question. So when you sin against God, do you feel bad inside? Do you mourn? Do you go, oh, God. That's what God's saying. Blessed are those who mourn. Not over your own personal sin and over the sins of the world. You have a mournful spirit for the things that offend God. Blessed are you if you have that type of thinking worshiping in spirit and truth they must and now listen I want you to I want you to get an idea here now when it talks about that same verse back here blessed are the poor in spirit all right the poor here is this verse at his gate laid a what beggar so it's the same word they're using so when God's saying poor, blessed are the beggars in spirit, right? You understand this, the, 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 what God is, you're actually at God's throne begging, begging God for forgiveness. You're begging God. You have a, a spirit such as Lazarus, and really Lazarus was a beggar his whole life. Was It doesn't go away after you're saved. This continual poor in spirit attitude is carried throughout the Christian life. And where does Lazarus end up in the end? All right. Worshiping spirit and truth. He must. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn. Boy, does that sound anything? That, would you want to be part of that? Like, I, I got a great spot for you. You can be poor in spirit and mourn. See, you see how the Christian life is not affected by the flesh? It's complete opposite. For they will be, what? Comforted. A mournful spirit. A mournful spirit. That means you, you, you know, Christ was a man of many sorrows, right? Um, but the blessing in being mournful is God will bring you comfort. And it, it, listen, it doesn't stop at salvation. Having a mournful spirit is continued through Christianity. And you mourn over the, the wickedness of the world. You mourn for unsaved people. You mourn for the things God mourns for. You rejoice for the things God rejoices for. Worshiping in spirit and truth, they must bless it of the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Boy, that doesn't sound uh, real appealing. Hey, let's be meek. Right? Meek doesn't mean weak. That's power under control. That you control your emotions. You don't, when you lose your temper, you control it. You, you control. And you do what you know God wants you to do. Moses was the meekest man who ever lived I mean, during that time, right? Um, but you see Moses very could be very um, to the point angry at times in his life. It doesn't mean, listen, what it really comes down to being meek, you stand for what God stands for, and you, it's okay to you get angry at those things. But in the meantime, anything against yourself, you control. All right? Both are humble, and humble is huge in the sight of God. And this is going to go on and on. I'm just going to read through these because I don't really have the time. Every one of these could be a message. A must. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger for the thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you hunger to be righteous before God? Do you have a desire for those things? Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. 
Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Let me tell you, you have to be humble to be a peacemaker. Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when people will insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Oh, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? He puts all these things together and says, this is what you're supposed to be, you know. And if you lost these things, you're not useful for the furtherance of the kingdom. A must, poor in spirit, mourn, meek, hunger for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness, insulted for righteousness. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Gives you a whole new meaning to what that means, right? Worshiping in spirit and truth, a must. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It falls right into what we just talked about, right? Gentleness and self-control against such there is no law. Worshiping in spirit and truth, the must of Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. There's nothing glorious in the flesh in people who worship God in spirit and truth. Every aspect of worshiping God in spirit and truth is taking on the, na the nature and character of Christ. Romans 8, 29, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become what? Well, like his son. So that the son would be the firstborn among many what? Well, brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. None of it is appealing to our natural, to our flesh. None of it will make sense in our reasoning. It's all a work of the spirit in us. Okay, well, worship is our lives, and when you look at Christ, you see exactly the definement of what he's telling us we need to be. If you want to be blessed, if you want to find fulfillment in the Christian life. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks, the Father sought you for this purpose to be his worshipers. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And you will be blessed. Blessed is the man or woman who does these things. You get it? And I didn't really give you, it was like the tip of the iceberg of what I wanted to give you in the time I had. I understand that God is in the business of conforming us into the image of his son to be true worshipers. Oh God, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord. It, it, it defines life. It takes us off this world. There's nothing in this world you have a desire for. It's a cursed planet, Lord, that one day you will destroy. This is not your kingdom here. You didn't come here to build a kingdom here. You came here to your kingdoms in another place, Lord, where we're going someday. But in the meantime, Lord, we're to be used by your spirit, Lord, to expand your kingdom, God, here and be a witness of Christ. And help us to carry these qualities, God, in our lives, Lord, and to find our fulfillment in what you say is blessed instead of um, Hollywood and the things in this world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.